Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the multi-GPU future of aerospace and defense. My name is Patrick Lanigan. I'm VP of Marketing for Wolf. A couple of things I want to mention before we get started. Number one, every solution you'll see here today is SOSA aligned and also available in OpenVPX. And two, most of these solutions come from real world examples. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Maynard, who is not only our Chief Technology Officer, but is also our Chief Product Visionary. Greg, take it away. Hey, Patrick, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. I know that uh, we're all probably webinared out over this pandemic, and I really appreciate the time. I hope that, um, yeah, you can take away a little bit of knowledge about what we're doing and uh, and we can connect in future. Okay, so before we get into this presentation, I'm just going to give a quick overview of Wolf and our capabilities. Um, so the way to read this is uh, basically on the left, these are the typical applications that we find ourselves in, everything from radar processing down to um, nowadays we're getting more and more into um, autonomous applications, um, AI inferencing, pattern recognition, that type of thing. Uh, the data interfaces are typically what we uh, connect into and out of our modules. Um, today, they're they're focused mostly on video standards, and as we go forward, Wolf's plan is to add some additional sensor interfaces, uh, such as RF, to that suite of capability. Um, typical architectures we'll get into in a bit. Um, and then the main thing, just to be aware of in all of our solutions, is we're very much um, focused on NVIDIA high-performance embedded compute technologies, so everything from discrete GPUs to um, new NVIDIA SBCs, which we'll talk a little bit about today. And then we do have um, a significant um, amount of product and IP that's, that's and capability really that's based around the Xilinx um, series of FPGAs, and that's for all of our sensor IO. So really, um, what we're about to talk to, I, I wanted to set the stage of kind of like why Wolf does what it does and, and what we're doing. And really what, what challenges us and what gets us really excited is we recognize that our technology really saves lives at the end of the day. Um, and because we have the capability to uh, translate, you know, what goes on in a, in a supercomputer, we translate that into an architecture for the extreme edge and bring those capabilities. And because we have that capability, it's really our responsibility to, to provide um, the best solutions that we can as quickly as possible. And that's really what our motivation is. And so really with this slide, just wanted to show um, the things that are happening in high performance compute are, are extreme and they're amazing. We, there's breakthroughs that happen all the time. Um, we see that whether it's from you know, um, NVIDIA's um, CUDA and Tensor Core enhancements to that software stack. Um, there's new SDKs um, that allow you orchestrate tasks between processors um, and really scale your, your solutions. Um, I'm really excited about the, the uh, DOCA SDK that's coming as an example. Um, we see a lot of enhancements on security. We know that's very, very important. Um, it's important to high performance compute as well. So we leverage those um, innovations and enhancements and apply those into our world, which is great. Um, and obviously high speed bus, so I don't have to talk too much about that. Um, but at the end of the day, it really is about taking that, that HPC innovation and then getting it tactically deployed in the field in record time. And that's really what Wolf is all about. So just looking at what the field deployable architectures, you know, actually end up being and look like, um, from a Wolf perspective, we are a module supplier, okay? So we work very closely with system integrators and partners um, to take our module level solutions with system, we have system architecture expertise and knowledge that we bake into our ICDs and how these modules work. Um, and then we work with partners and OEMs to, to put those into rugged systems. And obviously they get deployed from there into the, basically the harshest environments on earth. Um, and uh, also low earth orbit is where Wolf is today. Um, and hopefully, hopefully one day soon to be uh, further in space. So really what drives our technology innovation is very much you know, open standards. Um, we try to use them as much as possible. Um, as much as we were radical engineering, we always start with the baseline of an open standard as much as we can. And only in the cases where it makes you know, technology business sense to move beyond that, do we actually do that. And I think it's really powerful. I think it allows us to 
um, sort of focus on on the key um, around you know architectural choices and doing a good job there. Um, it helps us be faster actually, so it's it's actually fairly important from that perspective, um, which really means you know we get to focus on what we what we're really really good at, which is deploying those technologies and and worrying a little bit less about the plethora of options that come about when you're not following a, an open standard. And there's a, there's quite a few different open ones. I'm just going to talk about um, SOSA as a primary. Um, so SOSA Open Systems Architect Sensor Open Systems Architecture um, is a is a standard that Wolf has been committed to for the last probably two and a half three years. Um, all of our technologies have factory configuration options that support the platform, and our intent is to drive that into the future. Um, but really, the the idea behind SOSA it really is all about simplification. So uh, the VPX architecture. For those of you that 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 know it from its infancy, um, it was very complicated. There was a lot of ambigu ambiguity in it, um, which drove lots of choices, which drives lots of system level complexity. And so SOSA aims to really simplify that, um, making things more vendor agnostic, uh, makes things a lot easier to to deploy quickly, um, and a lot a lot easier to put a system together, which is really the key at the end of the day. Um, there's no shortage of problems to solve. We should spend a little less time, you know, futzing around with choices and just get on to the solving the real problem. And SOSA helps do that. Um, so uh, there is a new standard that is coming, uh, version 1.0. Uh, the teams are working hard to do that. Wolf is part of the uh, uh, SOSA working group, by the way. Um, and as far as uh, our latest view, it, it looks like we're still a couple of months away from having that ratification complete. Um, and then I wanted to also articulate our path forward in that. So when we talk about where SOSA is going, um, our focus is on delivering um, maximum expansion plane capability in 3VPX. And you'll see why that's important in some of the system architectures that are coming um, in the next few slides. Um, supporting daisy chain and star topologies. Um, again, you'll see a little bit about that. And uh, you know, pushing forward into higher speed busing. So, we're kind of going full steam ahead to provide 100 gig E and PCIe Gen 4 capabilities across the backplane, um, as well as, as enhancing security capabilities. Um, again, leveraging what is happening in the HPC world. So this is just a quick summary of that simplified view that SOSA brings. So still quite a few profiles here, you might say, uh, but com compared to uh, what the VPX standard calls out, this is a much reduced list. And so you can see our focus, uh, the gray rows basically represent places where we have Wolf solutions um, to provide high performance embedded compute GPUs or NVIDIA SBCs. And so we've got pretty much anywhere it makes any sense at all to have um, a GPU acceleration in 3U and 6U, we have solutions for that. Also, as much as you know, we're supporting SOSA and going forward, we do have options, factory configuration options of these products to support legacy architectures as well, legacy VPX systems. Um, and so the intent there is that we're not trying to make it, you know, more expensive, more complex. We're just we're trying to do everything with one simple design and support multiple system integrations to make your life as an integrator easier. So this is just a quick showcase of some of the products um, that we have available today um, and uh, that I'll be talking about in the presentation. So you know, high level, we've got a GPU and a fabric switch combination, uh, which is nobody in industry has this. So this is an interesting um, capability that, that enables uh, unique kinds of systems. We have sort of super high performance NVIDIA GPUs. Um, we've got, uh, the only card we're sort of experimenting a little bit with this. Um, this is providing video output over uh, a coaxial interface, Vita 67.3, um, and this is this is the only card that is doing this. So we're we're trying to um, we're trying to work with the SOSA group um, to look at at possibilities for this as we go down the line. So I think this opens up some capabilities that simplifies the system architecture. So. You know, at least I'm pretty excited about that. Um, other things here, so the the NVIDIA um, SPC, 6U and 3U card, uh, 3U is available now, 6U is in development. Um, these are basically radical 
products and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about these capabilities it's just it's a different class of product than than our solution that's that's uh, newly available so high level when we think about you know a great system architecture it really comes down to scalability and flexibility you know at the end of the day you're trying to come up with a solution that um, isn't isn't fixed you want something that that has some capabilities to it so that if if a new opportunity comes along or the mission changes or um, you know different different types of sensors might need to be connected to it you want to be able to deal with those scenarios and so when we put our module designs together that's exactly how we're thinking we're not just thinking about here's a module some capabilities it's about you know where where the system architecture challenge is going to be next Let's think about that a little bit and get those um, choices in place, and that's how we approach it. So today we're going to focus on primarily three UVPX. I'm going to show you a little bit of the architectural possibilities um, that can come about with our technology. Um, at the end of the day, um, some of these are based on real-world examples, um, but I don't want you to feel like this is the only options. That's that's not how we work. Um, so. We'll get into some of the architectures a bit, and if you have questions, uh, we can have those at the end of the presentation, or we can take it offline and talk about it a little bit more. And then I am going to talk about the the game changer, which is the 6U VPX microserver, um, which is focused around um, you know NVIDIA SPCs and combining the the ARM processor with GPGPU and Tensor Cores and what can be done there. Uh, just real quick on a couple terminologies. Um, when we're talking about PCI Express, we've got two concepts. One is the transparent port, and the other one is a non-transparent port. Basically, a, a transparent port um, is a connection between modules that software doesn't need to know about. It just it just happens. There's nothing special that you need to do. You would have one CPU processor and multiple GPUs, let's say, and they would all be connected by transparent ports. Um, Non-transparent ports are where you really need to connect more than one CPU together, so one more than one bus master, um, and that's that becomes more important when you get into a larger system architecture where you might have multiple SPCs um, and multiple uh, peripherals that need to be connected together. And then this is just some some pictorial examples of how modules can be connected together. So, you, for example, you might have a, a switch card with a bunch of peripherals and an SPC. And they all kind of communicate through the switch. That's one option. Um, also see extended star capabilities and also see daisy chain and mixtures of these things together. So you might have you might have a switch um, connecting to a card and then a daisy chain that connects to another card. That's a possibility. And that, that's a capability that we provide with our modules. All right, so the first case that we're going to look at is a medium-sized 3VPX system. Okay, so this is an example of a, a single PCIe domain. So it has one SPC. Um, it's got one uh, sensor card. So we're assuming this is an RF sensor card in this case. It could be, it could be video, it could be something else. Um, a fabric switch and a GPU. And you can see the connectivity is um, pretty basic. PCIe Gen 3 connectivity uh, between. And in this case, what's what's interesting to note is that there's um, the the uh, NVIDIA GPU Direct RDMA capability, um, which comes with the GPU, so this is this is a standard software feature, allows you to DMA data direct from the sensor over to the GPU. So because of that, we're architecting this to say I'm going to use an eight-lane interface and an eight-lane interface between the sensor and the GPU because that's where most of the data is going to go. I also have a four-lane interface back to the SBC, which is really acting like a a, you know, supervisor administrative function in this case. It's it's running the applications, but it's not handling all of the data. The data is going between the modules. So an example of how we can you know extend the capabilities of this, um, we can we can simply replace that fabric switch card with the Wolf um, GPU and fabric switch card. And so now we've got another processor, which could be a as an example an RTX 3000 or 5000 which is the latest generation um, workstation class processor that we use in the Extreme Edge. And now I now I have additional capabilities. So I still have the sensor connect, pushing all of the data to the switch. 
and this switch can divide. I can push some data to this GPU for processing. I can push it up to here. Um, and so I get some additional capabilities here uh, without changing any anything in my system, actually. I'm just replacing this card with another one. And that's, now I have more, more capabilities. You know, and then the other example, leveraging all six ports that are available on this existing card per the standard, um, we can add an additional GPU or an additional sensor, depending on the situation, um, to again, extend the flexibility or the scalability of this system. And this is all done within, um, you know, a four or five watt, uh, four or five slot uh, swap system. That is a mouthful. Okay, so just quickly summarizing what we just saw, you know, the architecture is flexible. Um, we're standardizing on the 14.6.11 slot profile, which by the way, um, most of the uh, opportunities that I see that come to me are, are leveraging these payload profile slots. So I've seen a lot of traction on this um, in the uh, SOSA aligned systems of the future. Um, and, and so we're standardizing on that and showing how you can basically put in sensor IO or GP, GPU processing um, and it's configurable. Um, in this particular case, we focused on a single PCIe domain. So it, it's a simple architecture um, and it can leverage star and daisy chain topologies. Okay, so this next one, we're gonna get into something a little more complicated. So this is, this is a bit of an eye chart. So I do apologize for that at least a little bit. Um, so the way to look at this one, so it's two different PCIe domains. So the system we were just talking about, you can just imagine that's the one on the left. And now we've got another system that's doing something else in the same box. It's in a second domain. Uh, so it's a, there's another CPU or SBC CPU that's driving it. Um, and so the dotted line connection is, this is the introduction of the non-transparent bridging port. Um, and so, so this is the place where if we have data to share between these processing domains, it would go across this path. Um, we do have partnership. Uh, there's a company called Dolphin Interconnect Solutions that has some very excellent um, software capabilities um, where you can basically drop in their software stack um, and you can then you use applications to push the data between the systems. Um, and so all the hard work is kind of done for you at the software level. Um, the other thing that's that's interesting here is is the uh, multicast capability. So um, a switch uh, can actually multicast to multiple endpoints the same data. So let's say I have an RF sensor, I'm capturing data, I'm pushing it here, and I want to send it to a couple places at once, the same data for, for processing um, um, asymmetrically. I would send it to, I could send it to GPU, <clears throat> SBC, and over the NTB link to somewhere in this domain any of the targets, depends what I want. Um, so that's a capability that um, you should be aware of when you're putting systems together. Um, really what it comes down to is the data flow becomes uh, the, the reason why you architect a system a certain way, especially in our business when we're seeing you know, RF and, and video sensor data becoming quite um, heavy, high, high throughput required there. We need to plan all that out. Um, this also is demonstrating the, the daisy chain concept. So what's kind of neat um, is with this payload profile, you end up with um, two PCIe ports that are possible. And so with the Wolf, Wolf design, you know, we can we can basically connect one port to one card and the other port to a card beside. And so we're extending the PCIe um, connection. That is a depending on the type of application that may make some sense to do at least one level deep. I'm showing two levels deep here just to highlight the point. So the example here is, you know, again, we can leverage the uh, fabric switch slots to add additional GPUs without adding anything additional to the box. Um, so that capability brings in here. Um, and uh, basically the, there's a capability of NVMe as a storage. So the NVMe is, is located here. Um, using the Dolphin Interconnect Solutions capability, we can actually share this storage between this SBC and this SBC. And why that might be interesting is that you might have sensor data streaming to this device constantly, and you may wish to then access this later. 
at some point in, in its application when it needs to access some of that data. And so that can be done um, without having to develop special application software to do it. This, this can be made to look like a local device um, over here. So it looks like it's a local device to both. Um, very, very important when it comes to software development that, that there's no special software um, you know, requirements need to be met. It, it, looks, it looks transparent. So just recapping on this one, um, you know, we talked about the flexibility of the system. Um, putting GPUs into the switches is important. Having the sensor to GPU mix being configurable um, is important. Um, also connected between uh, PCIe different bus speeds, that's also possible. So you can go between Gen 4 and Gen 3 if you have two different systems doing two different things. Um, and you do that through the NTB interconnect. Um, you don't require Dolphin software layer to make that work. Um, Dolphin just happens to have a COT solution that's pretty easy to get up and going. And I, I highly recommend it. I've worked with it before. It's quite well, quite good. Um, and then as we get into more NVMe storage solutions, um, understanding what's possible there, you know, do you need to re record, um, you know, encoded data? How much of it do you need? And do you need to record real-time data? And based on the answers to those questions, you've got some NVMe choices that can be can be selected there as appropriate. Yeah, so the last system architecture we're gonna look at today is based on um, what I'm calling 3VPX micro swap. Okay, so this is the smallest, you know, NVIDIA ARM GPU combination that we can bring together today. It's a two slot solution. Um, and in this case, it's a two slot solution because we have a payload profile that we want to attach to it in this example. Um, so super small, single PCIe domain. And, and again, so this is targeting an SBC profile, USB ports, display port, all that wonderful kind of stuff. But you're going to get an NVIDIA processor at the end of the day that's very, very well suited to, you know, autonomous applications, machine vision applications. Um, it's, a, it's basically a combination ARM processor, tensor cores, and GPGPU CUDA cores all in one. So then now let's look at what it means to extend that. So extending this out, again, you know, we're leaning on the non-transparent bridging port um, as an option. Um, it is an option that allows you to uh, work with Dolphin Interconnect. Um, as an example, that's something that we have integrated and tested on Wolf Hardware, so we know that works really well. Um, NVIDIA also has a capability where they uh, can configure these cards as endpoints or root complexes. So you can actually, you know, through modification of the BSP and writing your own applications, you can also enable that capability as a different way to do it. Um, I know that some people are playing with that. Uh, they're doing that with the development kits that you can buy off the shelf. Um, really important actually on that topic is whatever you can do in the development kit, um, should be translatable into what you can do in these Wolf NVIDIA SBCs. Um, the board support package is, is based on the exact same thing. Um, the only bit that's different is Wolf has tuned them a little bit um, to add some additional capabilities, but, but otherwise everything should map over. Um, so this is just an example of how you can scale that system out. Obviously you can, um, you know, tune the number of jets and sensors that you require. So if you have you know, you might have a sensor I.O. card that's connecting to Jetson 1 and another sensor I.O. card connected to Jetson 2. Um, that's um, something that can be worked out as well. Um, and that way it would be a, a three slot solution. I'm showing a four because this is based on a real um, example where we had to um, basically come up with a system where um, we wanted to, um, you know, demonstrate scalability with Jetson and we had a, a um, a couple different sensor cards that we needed to connect and that's why we did this. And then taking that concept further, um, you can see the, we've added some some complexity here just to give an idea of what's possible. So in this case, we're bringing in an x86 SBC. You might have a, in PCIe domain three, you may have um, you know a software stack that needs to run a certain way. You've got your own predefined applications and IP and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you might want to rely on a discrete GPU. 
And again, we can have that you know dotted line connection to bring the data between the systems. They don't have to do this. Um, I'm currently working on three different jets and architectures that are communicating only through LAN, right? They're not even communicating through PCIe. That's that's a possibility. Um, but really, the point here is that you know there's full flexibility here in the data flow, and you can move that between the processors in the way that makes logical sense to whatever your application is. Okay, so the basically when we, we're talking about Jetson, the big takeaway is just that it's a different, it really is a different kind of distributed processing module. Um, we're working closely with a couple close uh, partners actually to bring a payload slot profile version of this processor early next year. Um, and so stay tuned for that because that also adds some really interesting capabilities as we go forward. Um, you know, the Jetson is interesting and in that it can operate as a standalone processor. Um, it can operate as a coprocessor. It really just depends on what your um, data flows are like and what your software architecture really needs to be. Um, it's extremely efficient for the swap envelope. So as it turns out, a Jetson processor module does really well around you know 60 watts total, maybe 70 watts total. And that's really easy to um, to achieve in, in three VPX. So that's all quite nice. Okay, and then we're gonna have a quick look at six VPX. We're almost done guys and girls. I really appreciate you hanging in. So two products that I'm just going to quickly high level just so that you get the gist. Um, not, not to offend those who are six U uh, system architects, um, but, but my opinion is that the 3U VPX architecture is a, is a lot more um, complex challenge to it just because of the limited number of IO pins and all the point to point connections. There's a lot more trade offs that seem to be, need to be made there. So that's why I'm not spending too much time on 6U, but I did want to sort of highlight our capabilities there just because there are some new things that we want you to be aware of. So one of them is the um, dual RTX 5000. So this is you know, this is the, the pinnacle GP GPU processing compute card that's available today. It's in it's in 60 VPX. Um, it's got a lot of bus capability. So 32 lanes of PCIe, we talked about NTB, that's possible. Um, and so we can connect two, you know, CPUs to this single card. We can split it so that one GPU is dedicated to one CPU. There's, you name it, there's all different ways this can be configured. Um, what's really interesting too is it comes with an NV link connection, which is the first. So this is something that we've personally, or I've personally pushed for for a long time, is to try to get access to this dedicated bus that um, effectively turns these two GPUs into a shared frame buffer between them. So it's kind of like a big, a big single GPU, and you can you can use that to solve, um, you know, pretty big math problems. And so our, this is the first module. Um, that has that capability on it. And so that, you know, really, really excited about that and to see those use cases and how we, we pull these things together. And then the, the last six UVPX card is the uh, Jetson Xavier. So this, this is really a, a micro server. And I, I say that because it's um, each one of these processors and there are six of them, each one of them has its own, you know, embedded Linux, its own um, NVMe storage, um, it's got its own ARM processor, tensor cores, and, and GPGPU CUDA cores. And so a lot of capability that's possible on this card. It's extremely configurable. So it, it can do, um, basically it comes down to the data flows. So for example, if you wanted to, um, and this is actually the, the lead customer that's working on this, this is how they want to use it. If you want to have a, um, a data flow where you're doing synchronous and asynchronous processing. So you may have um, almost like a fault tolerance. So you've got a path where these processors are serially processing the data flow that comes in. At the same time, these ones are also doing the same. And in the event that one of these fails, the other one can be used to complete the transaction. And so that's that's one use case where we see um, a lot of interest, um, but really anything where you need to divide up um, a workload, um, this card is very, very well suited. And so um, 
again, it's 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 um, high speed LAN interfaces. It's high speed PCI Express, and it's it's basically leveraging NVIDIA's latest generation of Jetson technology. Okay, we made it. So I only have a couple slides left and then we'll take some questions if there are any. So as, as cool as it is to understand, you know, the, the capabilities we have to configure our cards in all different ways. And this, this is really intended to make it easier for you at the system level. Right. You don't want to make it so that you have to go off and, you know, figure all these things out on your own. That's exactly what we're here for. Um, also really wanted to highlight our cooling technologies. Um, so really at the end of the day, um, I see this all the time. Processors are, are pretty much always throttled in our space uh, because of the temperature extremes and because the processors can usually do a lot more than, than uh, we allow them to do. So example, RTX 5000 could be a 150 watt processor. Um, very few systems can actually keep up with that though. And so that means it has to be clocked down a little bit. And, and that's just, it's, it's wasteful, honestly. Um, and so Wolf has spent the last couple of years um, investing very heavily in what, uh, what we call Wolf Advanced Metal. And really we're, we're just recognizing that there's performance scalability that's right here on the table. We just need to, you know, get us, get us there. And so we, We've we've attacked it in a couple different ways. So the the primary goal is to to basically reduce the thermal resistance between the junction temperatures of all the ASICs inside the packages, and the cold walls themselves, or the cold cold interfaces, um, that could be different depending on whether it's conduction cooled or liquid flow through or what have you. Uh, but it's all about reducing that resistance. Um, we do that obviously in some proprietary ways. Um, it's about it's about manufacturing. It's about um, um, you know composite of the material. It, it's about a, a couple different things. But the point is that we've basically um, proven that we can we can increase performance by about thirty percent. Um, this is where we're right now. We're kind of working on the last little pieces to put it through production um, and get it up to production grade. And so our goal is to have that released by the end of this year, and it, it will be a game changer. Um, some other things that we're tackling with it too, which is interesting at the system level, is higher temperature operation. Um, so can't say enough about, you know, I've, I've seen many a system where, you know, it might be an 85C cold wall, but depending on the load out of the system, one of the slots might have to run a little bit hotter. And so our goal here is to provide more options where we can actually do that without sacrificing performance if possible. So that's part of our motivation of bringing this together. And then the final note on it is just that it is still tunable. So at the end of the day, you've invested a lot in the system architecture. It's kind of silly not to not to take a little bit of time just to fine tune, um, to sort of squeeze the maximum amount of performance out that you can in the architecture that you're already committed to. Okay, so want to leave you guys with a bit of a challenge. Um, and the challenge is real simple. Um, we absolutely love radical engineering challenges and we want you to bring them to us. Um, we want to talk about where your pain points are um, and see and, and honestly provide you with some guidance based on our experience of what uh, options we can provide, where we think you can go, where the risks are. Um, you know, I think that for me, that's 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 what I get excited about. That's why I'm doing this. Um, you know, as I said, I recognize our technology saves lives and we want to try to save as many lives as we can. So, so bring the challenges, let's talk about them. And, and you also at the same time help me and Wolf shape the future of where we are going with our, our technologies. So it's a, it's a total win-win. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Um, I know that I can babble a little bit, so I do apologize about that. And uh, let's open it up to some questions. Oh, one question. Um, so what what is the ratio of six U to three U VPX in kind of the the number of boards that we ship? Uh, good question. So the ratio that we're seeing right now, I would say, is probably around 60, 40, 70, 30, something like that. Uh, okay. Of three U, three U to six U. Right. So we definitely see like as far as like a trending, I I, um, I do see a lot of trend to smaller form factors. And so 
you know, I see lots of opportunity through VPX, a lot more going on there. And I didn't mention this, but um, SOSA is also uh, driving some small form factor standards, which I, I'm, I think are really cool. So I think that's, that's where we're going. We're generally going to go smaller. What is the typical, one question here, what is the typical lead time for Wolf products now? I guess this is coming kind of from the, the supply chain. Um... Yeah, so depending on the product, we're seeing basically anything from, um, you know, 18 weeks we're able to maintain on certain product, but we're seeing that drive up to 26 and in some cases 52 week lead time for some things. So um, we're taking steps to kind of get ahead of that. There, it's, it's basically related to um, a couple of, uh, strategic items and so we're managing that as best as we can strategically but uh, right. we need orders in I guess early or at least forecast guidance early so that we can help plan that great this whole supply chain thing's not been fun okay um, and here's a good question we hear this every now and then any any uh, research into smaller 3u form factors pc 104 3u s I guess uh, I've heard some uh, Greg, I think you showed me some half size three U, something. Yeah, like there's a, there's a couple. There's definitely some interesting um, topics that are on the table. I can't get into the details of some of them, but um, Vita seventy four is one that uh, VNX. Um, that's one that is is interesting for low power applications. There, there's a challenge around that one, which is is to do with the uh, you know the complexity of the architecture, which drives the cost really. Um, but that, that's one. And there's some other small form factors that I, I can't talk about because they're not totally released yet. Okay. Um, but it's sub, you can think of it basically as like half half the size of a three VPX system. That's kind of the goal. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. Uh, which cooling method do you ship most? I have heard mixed things from our customers on conduction cool versus airflow by versus airflow through. Is that evolving, Greg? I guess I would add to that. Is that, do you see any trends there? Yeah, so by far conduction cooled is the most um, common architecture that we see. Um, it's it's one of the easiest ones to implement, and that's that's probably why. Um, and that's honestly when we talk about Wolf Advanced Metal, that's that was our main primary focus. It's actually that's the harder problem to solve. So that's where we really we we set the bar. The other architectures we do ship them, so it's just at a much it's it's a reduced amount. Um, and it's an easier problem to solve actually for us. Um, I would say just to give a number like, you know, 10, 15% of what we do is not conduction cooled and the rest is conduction cooled. I do see that that's trending up. I do see that there's more platforms that have those cooling capabilities, um, liquid as well, liquid to the system is, mm -hmm. is coming on in the last couple of years. So I, that, I would expect all that to continue. Okay. Um, and here's one, um, does SOSA cover 6U form factor? Yes, it does. Yeah, it absolutely does. Okay. Okay. Um, and so the the uh, the Jetson card I talked about, the micro server and the um, the dual uh, RTX, those are SOSA aligned uh, products. Okay. And regarding cooling technology, I'm familiar with um, uh, CC uh, airflow through uh, liquid flow through, but not AFB. What does that stand for, please? Oh, AFB is airflow by. So where airflow through, the air goes through the middle of the module. Um, airflow by is kind of like a conduction card that has air flowing over the outside. And so it looks like a conduction card with fins, basically. Okay. Okay, this looks like a fun one, Greg. This will this will add to your day. I was wondering about switchless topology, aka digitizers directly connected via PCIe lanes, mainly due to increased uh, analog to digital uh, sampling and or ADC sampling and number of channels and avoiding data flow bottlenecks. That is an interesting one. Um, I think honestly, to properly answer that, I'd love to know a little bit more about what what we're trying to achieve there um switchless capabilities is something that um definitely is supportable there's no issue there um mm -hmm. i assume that that's mostly geared around latency yeah. usually usually it's about latency because each 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 hop is going to add something so okay um I, I definitely that's one that'd be a good example 
if uh, whoever asked that question, let's take that one offline and we can get okay. into some details there. Okay, that was Rick. I don't want to reveal the last name just for privacy, but we'll follow up with you, Rick. Thank you so much. Uh, what is the greatest functional advantage of the Wolf 134S compared to other GPUs, say a Wolf 134C? The greatest functional advantage. So, mm -hmm. so they're they're different. So the the 134S is really all about not having to uh, add additional slots to the system. So, um, it, it's got switching fabric capability. So it's made it's primarily made to switch. LAN and PCIe between the other devices in the system. And at the same time, we're adding a local GPU processor there. So um, going back to the latency thing, in some cases that might reduce the number of data hops to send data to that processor because it's on the central switch. Uh, mm -hmm. But really it's just about blending that HPEC capability with all the switching capabilities so that you don't have to you know, add additional slots, wait, all that nonsense. Right. And here's one about space products. I think I saw that what this one come in over email today, rad hardened, and maybe you could help differentiate between low earth orbit where we have seen our products used and uh, you know things that are further out in space that require rad hardening. Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So so this is this is something that is a bit infancy for us, um, but it's somewhere that we definitely want to go. Um, and it's it's when we're talking about rad hardening processors. You know, we want to understand, assuming it's a GPU application, we want to provide that capability. Um, it's about, you know, RAD hardening or, or RAD resistant uh, memory interface and ASIC, and it's a big challenge. So, you know, to answer that one, it's about um, system design, it's about testing, and it's about some design um, choices that can be made. So, that's not something that we have a solution with today, but that's something that we are um working on slowly i'll say it's not our primary focus but it's definitely somewhere we want to go and if you're if you're in low earth orbit for example um we definitely have solutions that are there and the typical philosophy there is that as long as the system is redundant enough it does not have to be you know very rad, rad hardened it just needs to be rad resistant and you can detect failures and you can reset the system when you need to and that you know, with the mission lengths of a satellite, for example, a satellite mission, uh, the length of time has to be up there is, is reducing. Um, that, that so far that seems to align, but we want to do better than that. We do want to find a good solution there. So definitely right. want to keep that discussion going. Yeah, and there's one third party we talked to I think last year, and you know we always know we can we can work with them to rad harden something. So yeah, we've done okay, some yeah. testing on Jetson, for example. You know, right, so. right. Uh, and then um, this is uh, Rick again here. Uh, the switchless question is just really about uh, the essence of the switchless question is the concern that switch topologies could limit data flow. Well, well really, the data flow is limited by it's limited by the the pipe that you're connecting. So it shouldn't be limited by the switch. The, sh the switch can can enable. It should be able to enable whatever it is that you need, right? If you've got an eight lane pipe, it's got an eight lane pipe, right? If you need 16, we can do that too. So I think that if there's concerns about bottlenecks, it what I like to do is just, you know, a basic, here's a basic system diagram and here's the basic data flows that I'm aware of in the bandwidths. And we look at that and we compare that with what's practically possible. And the other thing to remember is that you can never run at full speed, right? All these max numbers that everybody throws out are theoretical maxes you're, you're never going to see them in real life it'll always be a percentage of right okay and, hey patrick uh, yes i'm gonna i'm gonna cut you off because there's one more thing i just thought of we were just okay yeah. touched on this a little bit with the 13 4s discussion um yeah. one of the things that we did with 13 4s which is that fabric switch card and the 13 4c which is a uh, it's the only gp gpu card that has a sosa you know 16 lane expansion plane on it um, which you can do use in all different ways. But we also provided a Firefly um, optical interface on that. And so right. that that's pretty cool because then you can, you might have an architecture where, man, I really need to connect two systems. I don't have a backplane to do that, but you can actually do it off the front panel with optical cables. And so that's right. something that um, there's a COTS version of that. Um, and we can even do it over the backplane 
uh, that'd be a modification, but it's very doable to also do that over the back plane optically. So that's something that it's actually interesting. We were, we're working with a with a, a lead customer on that. It's a radar processing application, and this capability just kind of rolled out. You know, we we put it in for a different purpose, and we realized, oh hey, we can actually use that, um, you know, in a different way. So, so that's something that that's that's an interesting feature that's just there that's available. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we will follow up. We'll share the audio if it dropped out for anybody at, at, towards the, the questions at the end. And we'll follow up with those deeper questions as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And here's to getting out of this COVID cloud, albeit slowly. Thank you so much. Take <laughs> care. Bye. Thanks, everybody.